Welcome everybody. Welcome to today's um, webinar facilitated by Public Health Network Cymru. Um, I'm Marianne McKibben. Um, I'm a consultant in public health with Public Health Wales um, and I'm the lead for our healthy settings programmes which includes um, our Healthy Working Wales programme uh, where we work with employers to uh, improve health and well-being of the Welsh workforce. Um, today's subject matter will be of great interest to all of us thinking about how we deal with the after effects of the pandemic on the health and well-being of the population generally, but also of the Welsh workforce particularly. Within Healthy Working Wales, um, we currently have a survey underway uh, to hear from employers about the impact of the pandemic on their staff, all aspects, um, physical, mental health, um, you know, everything you can think of really, um, and their likely needs to support their employees um, both now and going forward, and how we, it will help inform how we and partner organisations, uh, including Welsh Government, can best respond to those needs. So we'd be very grateful for any support to publicise the survey to employers, large and small across Wales. And this is a shameless shout out for our survey um, and for anyone taking part today to see if your organisation can actually complete it as well. Um, the link to the survey is um, www.opinionresearch.co.uk slash phwhww but we will we will post it i think in the chat bar on the side of the meeting um, and it can also be found on the public health network cymru news web page if you want to have a look there so on to today's presentation um, i'm i'm really pleased to um, be able to introduce to you our presenter dr a adrian neal who's a consultant clinical psychologist and head of well-being for Aniram Bevan University Health Board. Um, Adrian qualified as a clinical psychologist in 2003 and has um, completed a master's in organi organisational psychology and specialises in occupational health and well-being, um, particularly within the public sector. Um, he moved to Wales in 2014 to join Aniram Bevan University Health Board. Um, and has been involved um, since then in collaborative projects with the Welsh Ambulance Trust, Welsh, Welsh sorry, NHS Finance Academy, Gwent Police, um, Health Education and Innovation Wales and Powys University Health Board. So Adrian views psychosocial factors as the cornerstone to organisational culture, health and well-being and ultimately sustainability and that very much aligns with I have to say the principles of, of our Healthy Working Wales programme. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Adrian. Um, he co-leads the innovative Leading People programme within the Health Board um, and is co-chair of the Leadership and Management Faculty within the British Psychological Society's Division of Clinical Psychology. So eminently qualified and connected. Um, and he's published widely on mental health, uh, occupational health, organisational culture and well-being. Now, before we start, um, we just have a bit of housekeeping to get through. So um, to help us really get the best out of today's event. So if you could please um, ensure that your cameras and microphones are muted for the duration of the webinar, just really to avoid um, distractions. Um, they will be a Q&A session after Adrian's presentation. So if you have any questions, please could you submit them in the Q&A box, which you can open at the top right of your screen where you'll find the question uh, mark icon. Um, we'll also use the Q&A box to post any links or announcements for the presentation. And if you've got any technical difficulties, please submit those in the Q&A box and our facilitators will do their best to, to sort things out for you. Um, if there are any questions we don't have time to answer, then we'll follow up with with um, an email to the to the person who's asked um, after, after, or to all attendees actually after the event. Uh, captions are available in English and Welsh. However, if we are aware that the automatic captions in Welsh are not always that accurate. So um, just be aware of that. You can access captions by clicking the icon with the two letter C's in it. Uh, the event, we're almost there, I promise. The event is being recorded and will be available on the Public Health Network Cymru website and on um, their YouTube channel. Um, and we also ask for feedback on, on, on the network events um, and you'll be sent a link to a survey in the Q&A box at the end 
and it will also be emailed out to everyone attending. So after all that <laughs> long intro, I'll now hand over to Adrian to start the presentation. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, thank you. OK. Uh, just looking for slides. OK, just checking you can see the slides. Not yet. OK, excellent start. <laughs> right then. Try not to panic. Uh, why isn't it not there? Mm, that's frustrating. OK, this is where we need some interlude music, isn't it? Samantha? Yes, that's right. Uh, mm, that's really puzzling. Okay. We had them there a minute ago, didn't we? Just before the event started. Yeah, we did. I'm just going to try again. It just may be a simple switch, turn it on and off again. Hmm, that's weird. No PowerPoints at all. OK, I'm going to... Adrian, can I perhaps... Hello, this is Casper. Adrian, yeah, can I suggest right. that you um, share your desktop screen? Is it possible to share your desktop and then open the PowerPoint like that? Yeah, um, I'm just looking. This is where my anxiety overrides my executive capacity to think uh it's really weird all i'm getting is a number of word documents and emails that are coming up okay let me okay apologies everybody i'm um Right, see if that works. OK, it doesn't work. So I can see it on my. Save to desktop. Are you able to share it, Casper? Just wondering. Just waiting to see. Um... Just, um, Castle, I'm just going to email it to you quickly, just in case I fail at this. Yeah, OK. Apologies, everyone. Best laid plans. <laughs> I actually attended the rehearsal. You wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about rehearsals. Um, OK, so I've just sent you the, the, the document, Casper. I'm still struggling to actually find the thing, which is really frustrating. Oh, hang on. There it is. Got there it. Go. Brilliant. Yeah, got it. Thank you very much, Adrian. Excellent. Just share that. Now. Right, it's there. Thank you, Adrian. I think we've just got it. Right then, let's let's take a deep breath and start again. Right, uh, um, Brenda, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I would like to um, say thank you for inviting me. Um, I would be keen to just to frame this really in some context. So, for me, the context of I guess thinking about employee well-being in the public sector, it needs to be framed in the, the I guess, with some uh, realism around what I can offer. So I, I really don't see myself as an expert on the whole public sector. My experience is very much embedded in the NHS. Uh, I am a clinician at heart, so you'll always you'll have that perspective as well. Um, you know, I, I can share much clearer sense of what is happening within a single health board, so in Iron Bevan, um, but I am I am connected to uh, NHS England and also to to other NHS and public sector parts of Wales. But um, please don't see this as the definitive kind of um, truth of the matter. It isn't. I think that's the problem: is that we, you know, we are not through the pandemic, so the idea of understanding the impact, I think, is 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 a little premature, and that really is the core tenant of my argument um, and, and the way I think tends to be, um, you know, understand the problem, uh, um, understand, gather the information and then do something about it. So I, I spend a lot of time looking for the best quality evidence I can uh, and this presentation really is my attempt to draw um, together information that some of you may be aware of, some of you won't be, but really to, to try to create a narrative based upon what evidence we have. Um, 
but again, it, it isn't a systematic literature review, so um, that's my get out of jail free card there, really. Um, but what I would really like to do is say, look, uh, um, my understanding of workplace well-being is also important in that I, I'm, I come of the, the, the kind of organisational psychology perspective of well-being and that it's very much a psychosocial phenomenon within the experience of work, not necessarily linked to health and ill health or disease, although obviously um, you know, mental health is a significant uh, factor and remaining healthy is really important. But for me, I really, my focus tends to be on psychosocial well-being rather than illness per se. So you, you'll probably see those biases play out as I describe to you where we're at. Um, so that's my kind of general context of me and my perspective and I guess what I can offer. What I'd like to do is to take us to kind of uh, take a snapshot of maybe how things were before the pandemic. Now, um, this is obviously a, 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 a document or a quote from the King's Fund, but um, we have lots of evidence to say things weren't great before the pandemic from a well-being perspective. Now, um, that might seem obvious, but um, I guess a lot of focus has been placed upon the pandemic and what that you know, the impact that is having on people. Um, but we really need to bear in mind our baseline, and actually we don't have great measures of baseline, um, was not, wasn't great to begin with. Um, I won't quote this to you, but, and you can follow the references uh, when you look at the slides later on, but uh, uh, pre-COVID we were, we still had a mountain to climb um, and the mountains just got more complicated, I think, um, in the last 12 months. Um, here's a few headlines from uh, uh, documents in 2019, all stating that all the, the, the key professional groups were struggling as medics, as nurses, and um, even psychologists were struggling before Adrian, the pandemic. Adrian, um, yeah. are you are your slides moving on? Because I think we're still on the on the um, the front slide at the moment. Yeah, mine are moving on, so I don't know what's oh, happening. Okay. No, we're stuck on the front one, on the first one. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> okay. Are they moving at all? I'm flicking them back and forth. No. Where? Okay. Nothing. Um, Casper, it might be worth you sharing yours. The ones yeah. I've just sent you, so we can just, I'll, I'll exit this. Yeah, well, give me one second. I'm just going to open up the slides now. Oh, that, this. That's showing the quote you were just talking okay. about there. Okay, so shall I try again? Yes, what? it looks like it's... If you, if you, uh, sorry, um, Adrian, can you just try and flip through the slides again as you were doing? Yeah, is that moving? Um, I'm, I'm afraid not. No. no it's, that's interesting. It's if you fun. if you if you come sorry if you come out of it and yep. as um, we can see yours cursory, if you just click through the slides in the one two three on the side there. Yeah. Yeah, that moves. Is it? Okay. Is it? Are you able to do the presentation like that? Yes, absolutely. Let's use okay. that. Okay. Thank um, you very much. Okay. Cheers. So apologies, everybody. This is going from bad to worse. Let's hope the content makes up for it. Um, so where I was at was at this slide, really saying, look, we had problems before the pandemic. Um, plenty of documentation to say that was the case um, and the pandemic really just made things more complicated um, but our baseline was already a point of, of um, I guess organisational well-being I wouldn't say crisis but certainly problems um, and all the professional groups pretty much say the same so this is from medics this is from nurses and um, even the psychologists were saying they were struggling and this takes us back to uh, actually that's the 2016 one. So some problems are long standing. So I guess what we need to think about is, um, you know, it's really helpful to start asking very big questions. Um, so how do we know what the impact has been? You know, how do we where do we look? Um, do we even know what we're looking for? Uh, there's been a lot of focus on mental health. Do we really want to be focusing on that? Um, actually, is it too soon to know what the impact is? Because um, you know, given the talks of the third wave, given the talks, uh, uh, well, we, I don't think we are through it yet. So can we actually say we understand the impact? Um, and also, do we need to kind of challenge some of our assumptions about what we think has been going on? So hopefully uh, the next half an hour will help you question some of those and maybe even get some answers to that. So stepping right back, if we want to understand impact, then we need to understand context. So th this is a study, a fairly recent study. So a public health 
um, in collaboration with some some people within my health board, just looking broadly at the Welsh population. Uh, and what that's really saying is that um, psychological distress is now not uncommon. OK, um, so we're looking at clinically significant psychological stress uh, in around half of the population of Wales. Now, you could kind of put your critical lens on and look at the methodology and, and look at the the, uh, the the return rates. But basically, the picture is everyone has been struggling over the last 12 months, um, whether you work in the public sector or not. Of course, public sector is, is the biggest employer in Wales in its various forms. So the fact that you know, people who work for the public sector are also citizens of Wales. You know, it is a no brainer. Um, everybody seems to be struggling um, and at least half of that group um, significantly. So that's the context. Um, looking at the workforce within uh, uh, the public sector, I'm starting to draw upon some of the evidence around um, some of the quality evidence around surveys. So we have an NHS England survey. Um, this was recently published, but I think was collected pre second wave um, and they picked up some really useful um, headlines. Now, important to say that this survey is massive. Um, you know, 600,000 response, you know, nearly 50 percent response rate is, is huge from a survey point of view. So I, I, I actually have some faith that this is this is valuable information. So what we're saying is that uh, a lot of people are saying um, that they came to work when feeling unwell, um, but actually less than they did in previous years. Um, a lot of people are saying that they are feeling unwell as a result of work related stress in the 12 months, which doesn't surprise me, and that has gone up since the previous year, um, but actually has been increasing steadily year on year, um, really since 2016. So that, that you know, has COVID done that or is that just an, a trend moving? So really important to consider the bigger picture. Um, and we can, of course, generalise from NHS England, but we can't exactly map it onto our experience, but there are lessons there. But actually, paradoxically, um, what the survey also picked up is that actually um, the staff group, their morale and motivation either seems to be static or getting better, which is fascinating. So, um, you know, 71.4% said they was they received the respect from their colleagues that they you know more so than they did uh, um, of late. But actually, that I don't think the well, maybe not more so, but very similar. You'd expect that to come down during the pandemic. Um, whoops. And then you'd you know issues around uh, um, the management relationship, which is and we know massive positive correlate of well-being. Um, no real changes there. Uh, so we're, we're not seeing massive changes in this NHS survey, uh, uh, which has a, you know, a significant number of people responding. So, you know, the picture there is not clear uh, and actually we're not seeing this significant deterioration of the working experience, which is really important to acknowledge. Um, looking at our own NHS Wales survey, so obviously a smaller system, but still a good return rate, you know, nearly 20 percent, which I think is the is the threshold for good quality survey uh, return, but across 13 organisations. Now what we're seeing here is you know, a collection of, so, so these are questions that were asked, oops, um, and these were the, the, the range of responses in the strongly agree and agree category. Now there were five points of response, but what we're seeing is more than half are looking forward to going to work, are enthusiastic about their work, would recommend their organisation to others to work, are proud of their organisation, would go the extra mile, which is always a challenging one, um, you know, feel involved in, in issues of change um, and have a sense of belonging from their work. So looking at this survey, a lot of certainly NHS Wales employees, um, you know, and if you were to extrapolate that, uh, are OK, are doing you know, are feeling OK and are connected to their work. Now, this is not to say the last year has not been stressful and very demanding, but it's to say they are still getting a lot of the the um, the reinforces that work, you know, that work should be offering people and that it gives them a sense of belonging. It, it helps them feel like they can connect, that they are, are they have a purpose um, and they have some some pleasure and enjoyment from work. So, so actually this is really important data to hold on to. Now again this survey was um, was done pre second wave so 
we'd need to see what this looks like next year. Um, but it does make you think. It really does make us think actually things are not quite maybe as we expected. Um, this is a study which was from the BMJ, uh, a quite a nice study, a small one, but a qualitative study. So actually uh, more about the granular details of people's experience of, of the pandemic and the impact rather than a massive N. Um, but actually what it starts to flag is how the how the pandemic is in you know impacted on people and their their experience of work and you know their their sense of who they are and what they do now this uh, uh, i think it was a thematic analysis looked identified five key themes that kind of were were um i guess impacted on so issues around communication work stresses uh, uh, structural or support structures resilience which is a tricky concept to the best of times uh, and personal growth. Now, what this is showing and why I'm showing sharing this with you is because it shows the granularity of impact um, and not all is bad. So I think for us, it's really easy to to kind of buy into a simple narrative in that it's all awful um, or everyone is traumatized. And I think uh, um, some people will have that experience, but many don't. Um, for many, um, a whole range of different experiences have unfolded during the last 12 months um, and we need to understand those um, if we're going to kind of plan the next 12 months so to speak so so this really study helps you see some of the the more specific uh, uh, kind of granular details uh, and helps it make look make it look a bit more gray than than kind of black and white and of course i'm i'm a, a psychologist so i quite like gray um, because I, I suspect that's the stuff of life, but um, it's really helpful to see um, things are not awful for everybody all the time. Um, and I guess sticking with that theme, here is a, a paper which um, I was involved in with from the British Psychological Society looking at the well-being of psychologists. Now, this was a pre-second wave kind of paper. You know, we, we gathered data from around 200 practicing psychologists across academic and, and the, the um, their practitioner domains um, and we found a kind of similar thing to the BMJ study in that kind of 10 key themes were picked up on. I won't read these out um, kind of verbatim but you can kind of see that it's it's much more granular. Um, there's some really positive stuff, there's some stuff that's very difficult, um, there's a lot of stuff that about is about needing to adjust and change and accommodate new experiences um, and I think for us the more we have an understanding of how the the um, how the pandemic affects us as individuals, but also the context of our work, uh, the better prepared we were to, or we will be, to to manage the next twelve to well twelve months to five years, I think, because um, I really do think that's the recovery time frame we need to be thinking of. So another just useful paper saying, look, it's complicated. Um, so changing gears slightly, of course, there's also a mental health narrative. Uh, and what I don't want to be saying is that mental health is not a relevant factor. It, it absolutely is. I, mean, I manage a, uh, um, a well-being service for staff, which really is a, a psychological therapy service for staff. Uh, and I know firsthand that a lot of staff from across the workforce are struggling and some of them absolutely do have difficulty with their mental health. So I need to say that very clearly. I guess what I need to also stress is that there are some interesting and not necessarily helpful narratives out there talking about you know kind of tsunami of mental health problems um, or a kind of catastrophic collapsing of the mental health of the workforce now i, I really need to urge caution uh, and maybe a kind of um critical consumer perspective on those i know those narratives um these are just two studies that i've i've chose to focus on just to kind of illustrate the point so the, the top study um uh, both of these studies are um looking at class uh, at, at workforce that would be considered to be um, frontline. Now I'll talk a little bit later. I'll, I have a bit of a problem with the idea of the frontline because I, I don't think it's a helpful thing. But really what we're talking about is um, medical staff, including nurses that work in critical care environments. Um, so they're a very specialized, very focused part of our health services. Now the top study, the, the Greenberg study um, that was Data was collected after the first wave, um, published uh, kind of mid second wave. 
um, kind of grabbed quite a bit of the headlines because it was really flagging. Uh, although it's quite a balanced paper in many ways, they are very clear in saying this is an estimate, not a reality, but they were flagging that you know nearly half of the workforce um, that they surveyed um, were struggling to the point where they may be diagnostically um, or, or diagnosable, if you like, with a severe mental health problem. Now, I, I really struggle with that because I do not see that. And um, many colleagues across the UK are not seeing the same thing. So I guess it, it, it flags the need to be really cautious about um, being critical of looking at the literature and looking at what it does and doesn't say. The second study, uh, in my eyes, a bit more of a robust paper because it's a longitudinal paper, um, ended up uh, flagging rates of of um, potential PTSD um, in 12 uh, or 10 to 12 percent of, of the, the staff group at different points in time. Uh, and in many ways, that's in keeping with the literature um, pre-COVID. So in many ways, this is saying COVID has not had a massive impact um, on the mental health of that workforce. Now that in its own right is problematic, but it just shows you you've got to be really careful how you digest the information around, um, you know, both papers have problems with with uh, their working methodologies, but actually all research does. So we we just need to be you know, careful around which narratives we we hold on to. Um, and again, you know, thinking about mental health, sometimes it's not always the most useful way of framing um, or, or, or looking at the lens through which we look at the experience of people during the pandemic, because it's not really all about mental health. Um, Sounds like a rant, it isn't. It's just, I guess, a words of caution because there's a lot of literature out there pointing in a, in a certain direction. Um, thinking more broadly about mental health, you know, we do need to think about, well, what about people beyond um, the front line? Um, it's when you notice you have a typo in your in your, your uh, slides. It's like embarrassing, but you know what I mean. Um, do we need to question actually what is the front line and what, you know, what does it mean? Because in my eyes, um, I have not come across anybody that hasn't been affected in some way, um, whether they're a, a porter, you know, a cleaner, um, right through to, you know, to to our, our uh, um, you know, our execs and our leaders. So everybody has been affected in some way. So I think the front line actually is not a helpful metaphor for understanding impact. Um, you know, we haven't had the tsunami of trauma. Um, we need to reframe that and think about what that's about. Um, and we need to kind of think, OK, well, you know, where else do we need to to look to understand the wider impact, given that, you know, humans are complex. We're tricky psychosocial beings. Well, we're biopsychosocial beings, but I'm a psychologist, so I, I focus on the, the bit I know a bit more about. Um, we don't really need to just focus on illness or wellness. We need to focus on well, what kind of things are important to us, what makes our lives more valuable and 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 kind of enriches us. And that will give us, I think, a slightly better sense of impact. So, looking, uh, uh, I guess, closer to home, um, one of the I wanted to share with you some data from um, uh, surveys that we've done within an Iron Bevan. So, it's, it's some simple, kind of simple methodologies. You know, reasonable return rate, um, but over three surveys, quite a few staff have responded. Um, we were really interested in taking a temperature rather than trying to kind of find a fixed truth. Um, so we, we thought, let's ask people. Um, and what we really were interested in is, well, how, how people thought they were coping um, and how tired were they, how fatigued were they? So two questions that are very simple, but actually give us quite a bit of insight into um, you know, where people are at. Um, so the next two slides are just graphs of of how people responded to those questions across um, across the survey point. So if we so how are you coping or how well are you coping from very poorly to very well? Um, what you immediately see is actually there's a really interesting. I wouldn't call it a bell curve because it is skewed, but you can see what I mean. It's there's a there's definitely a clumping. Um, across the three surveys of where people are at. Um, now, if you look at the colours, the May is the first survey. The grey is the February survey, so very recent. So we're covering both waves. Um, not a lot of change. So we've not seen a catastrophic 
kind of shift in, in people not coping. There are significant groups of people that are struggling. I think we absolutely have to acknowledge that. But most people are clustered in the OK to relatively well. So I think that's a really important message. Now that in no way can we use that narrative to minimise the real challenges um, and people that are really struggling, because I absolutely know they're there. Um, but we need to think about the bigger picture. So looking at that very simple question, how well are you coping? Um, most people are within the OK to relatively well group and have remained there across three data collection points. So to me, that's quite helpful um, as a kind of temperature check. And that, that to me says, OK, well, we need to think carefully about um, some of the more dramatic narratives and we need to know more about these people's experiences because that will help us um, respond to their needs. The second question, um, how fatigued do you feel? Now, we only introduced that in November, so we've got two data collection points. But again, there's a similar pattern. Um, you know, we've gone from people that are energised and ready to go, so um, affectionately known as the energizer bunnies, um, you know, small groups, but there, um, and not that massively different across the two data collection points. So this will be following the second wave. Um, but the other points are also there. So that group on the right hand side um, being fatigued and, and uh, you know, and not knowing how they will cope and sustain themselves, you know, the worrying group, if you like, um, they've shifted a little bit, but again, not massively. So I, I think these you know, these figures are, are remaining quite static. So I think there's much more to the story than, uh, than we are expecting. But on the whole, most people are scoring, um, are saying they're tired. Um, some are you know, physically tired, some are cognitively, emotionally tired, some are both, um, which I think we can all recognise. But most of people are in that middle, um, which I think is really helpful to 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 kind of hold on to. Um, so so slightly more focused observations, really. So, so these are themes from my service. Um, so what we want to just flag is obviously sickness absence is used as a metric for many things. I don't personally think it's a very helpful metric for well-being because it's it's much trickier than that. But you know the, the sickness absence right across the public sector, I think, skyrocketed towards the the beginning of the pandemic because of course it was extremely stressful and many people became unwell with COVID. Um, it has now settled. Um, but we have a proportion, a large proportion of people that see it, their, their absence seems to be linked to their well-being and their, their mental health. Now, um, it's harder to dig deeper into that um, at the moment, um, but what we've observed within our service is you know, no massive surge in trauma. Um, but yes, some people have come through seeking help with trauma, but it's not being as much as we predicted. There was a, a significant increase in self referrals for help following the first wave. Um, but most of these were not kind of uh, people struggling with diagnostic levels. There were people that were, uh, you know, they were distressed, they were um, anxious, they were kind of feeling overwhelmed, um, they were experiencing grief demoralization, you know, all, all this stuff that is is subclinical in the sense, but still very important. Um, and they were seeking help. Um, but I would not say this was a, uh, um, you know, uh, this is a more complicated, nuanced set of challenges, not a, um, a diagnostic level of mental illness. Um, we have more senior people asking for help, so that I think that's a helpful thing. Um, and also people are acknowledging that um, the the pressures outside of work are beginning to become much more of a factor in how they're coping. So you know, the, the, the implications of lockdown, the restrictions around um, movement and socialising and, and activities that people might use naturally to help them kind of uh, adjust and cope with work. Um, it would make sense that those become uh, almost of a bigger issue, uh, a secondary factor of stressor, if you like, through the, through the, the, the pandemic. Um, and I guess we've also noticed um, issues with teams and people feeling or coming out of the first and second wave feeling different in terms of their connection to their teams, their work um, and their psychological contract with with the organization. You know, you kind of expect these things because, um, you know, many people experience things that were not within their 
the, the normal range of experience. So um, questioning these relationships, these these really important cornerstones of well-being, I think is normal. Um, and for some it's perfectly healthy and for others it may lead them um, into other places. But um, to me, this is a, a I guess, a, a cluster of experiences that very much fit for me that that kind of mantra, it's OK to be not OK. Um, I think that's really important to acknowledge. All these things are perfectly understandable in the context. Um, and to be honest, if you didn't see them, I think would be a bit a bit strange, um, but they are very different from diagnostic levels of mental health problems. So we need to be clear about that. Um, so just trying to pull some things together, just two more slides, um, slightly busy slides, but I'll, I'll, I'll work through them. I think we've got time. So, so where does that leave us in terms of understanding the impact, but also starting to respond to uh, the need that may have developed? Um, I guess what we can say is yes, there has been an impact, but it is more tricky. It's complicated, um, hard to really put your finger on, very hard to measure, and it's not all bad, which to me is really helpful. Um, so we know that the 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 first wave was different to the second wave um, in terms of experience. Um, people going into the first wave, there was much more anxiety and uns around uncertainty um, and fear of infection. Um, second wave, people were much more tired and, and kind of, I think, motivation and morale took a beating um, from, from many people. Um, but we know that there's massive variation out there that, you know, wherever you are within the public sector, it's had an impact and you have your own story to tell, which is perfectly valid and legitimate. Um, it just may be different to someone else's. And I, I'm really keen that people hold on to that because they may feel that you know, theirs is less important. It really isn't. Um, your story is, is as important as everyone else's um, because your recovery will will kind of um, will rest upon your experience. Um, some people have actually thrived. Um, so I, I think that maybe is not a very popular thing to say, but um, and those that have talked to me that said they've thrived would be worried about saying it. But I think that's really important. Um, you know, this has not been a linear experience parallel by everybody. Um, some people have not just remained engaged, but become even more engaged and committed to their work. Um, some people have a renewed sense of purpose, which from a well-being point of view is absolute gold. Um, you know, purpose will bind teams together, will make people, uh, 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 will motivate people to do things that previously they may not have done. Um, so interesting how those those kind of protective factors for some have, have really kind of been been turbocharged. Now again, this is for some, not all, but if you go back to those graphs I showed you, I think it's more common than we think. Um, some people are having a, a kind of, well, what am I doing and why am I doing it kind of conversation with themselves. Um, and I think that will play out as the time goes forward and, you know, their work will have changed. Um, and that's really important because people's work uh, um, actually is very rarely static. Your, your whatever's on your job description, give it two or three years, probably has changed. Uh, the last 12 months has really accelerated that change. So people will need to re-engage with their work if it has changed and there may not be the work that they want to do. So that's another area that will need to be focused on by organisations and managers. Um, yes, some people have very clear, very specific mental health difficulties um, and need help um, and, and evidence-based a treatment and I absolutely unequivocal in that. I just don't know how many and whether it's been a significant increase. Certainly is not the increase that we expected. Um, I think because we don't have baselines across our workforce, we don't actually know what a normal level of, of mental health difficulty is other than the the um, the rates that you might see in populations. Um, I, I think public sector probably is different to to um, population prevalence levels, but, but we, we, we will no doubt find out in time. Um, people are tired physically, psychologically. I've said that and I think for some it is just a fatigue and they need to relax and have a break and holiday. Um, a lot of people haven't been taking holidays. Um, we need to catch up on that. Some people that the fatigue may be deeper and it may be more indicative of burnout. Um, certainly in some areas, burnout levels 
And by burnout, I mean a kind of emotional and psychological, um, essentially running out of resources, running out of fuel, <coughs> and, and feeling like the work is no longer rewarding or engaging for you. Um, but this was quite high in some areas before COVID. So um, again, not surprising that for some it's got worse. Um, yes, a lot of people reporting broad psychological distress. Um, you know, uh, um, I guess the evidence from my service is, is anecdotal in some respects, but I suspect it's probably um, repeated in other places. I just don't have the evidence for that. Um, but we have problems re relating to adjustment and you know very normal difficulties. You know, increased stress, increased demand of increased workload, changing roles, you know, loss. And that's not just loss in a sense of grief and bereavement. It's loss for um, for services, for colleagues. It's loss for familiarity. So it's a it's a more complex problem. Um, people feeling disconnected and dislocated, particularly people perhaps who who are redeployed. Um, and had less control over that. Um, people feeling overwhelmed and that inevitable moral distress, that feeling disconnected or, or, or I guess witnessing things that you don't morally agree with um, generates. Or it's all in the mix, but none of this is mental illness in my, in my opinion. Um, and, and lastly, we know people have questioned their, their core relationships. Now, by core relationships, I'm thinking of relationships with self and relationships with other and their work. So, you know, some people, they're questioning their professional identity. Um, and we know for people that, that are vocationally trained, that is problematic. Um, people are questioning their relationship with their work, their work environment, their peers, and even their employer. But again, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I'm not surprised by this given the unprecedented nature of the last 12 months. Um, and it, it's not bad or, or good, it's just, it is just a natural consequence, I think, of a challenging um, year that needs to be made sense of and processed and, and kind of um, people need the, the time and space to appreciate that perhaps that's what they need to do. Uh, and I guess one of my fears is that um, as the pressure to get back to normal picks up, people aren't processing their experiences and it just gets bundled into a drawer and then, um, well, that, that will have implications down the road. Um, so lastly, if we're starting to look at where next, um, being a little opaque with this because I don't really know. I, I've got a sense of where we're heading and, and certainly we've developed a strategy within an RM Bevan which really is focusing on, on, a, on recovery and adjustment. Um, but we really don't know what the impact will be and we won't know for some time. Um, you know, a lot of the, the research around the impact of, of um, you know, kind of community emergencies or natural disasters talks about a, a five to seven year recovery time frame. Now, these are for single incident catastrophes. Um, we've had something incredibly complicated for a year, so I, I certainly would consider this to be a natural disaster, but not in the way we've ever experienced before. So it's going to be a while before we realise how this is playing out from a well-being point of view. Um, we need high quality, mixed methods, longitudinal research. No question about it. We, we want studies that look across a number of years, not just take one sample of time. And we want studies that ask questions about people's experience, uh, not just ask them to fill out a questionnaire. Um, and of course, we've got a third wave coming potentially, so that that will you know that will complicate matters as well because it will be different to the first and second. Um, we need to understand how these different experiences affect people and how they cumulatively impact. Um, we need to broaden what we define as the front line. In fact, if I had my way, we'd get rid of that definition completely because we need to focus on all the public sector um, and appreciate the impact in all of the subtle nuanced ways. Um, you know, we all have our front lines and I think that's really important to hold on to. Um, and it is a slightly dangerous narrative just to focus on that one that one concept, which actually is, is, a, is a military metaphor. And, and to be honest, I don't really think holds a lot of water when trying to frame um, the impact on public sector. Um, we need to question our assumptions about impact. Um, and we need to think about wider ways the organisations can offer support, not just focusing on mental health. Okay, we need to 
think about how our systems can be supported to grow, to develop, to recover, um, because therein lies the real resources. And we need to support people that are having very specific mental health difficulties, no question about it. Um, but if we just focus on the individuals, um, it will impact negatively on our recovery from this. Um, and we need to be really honest about where we were before the pandemic um, and not frame any changes or developments um, as a response to COVID. Um, and in many ways, uh, it's why I, I like a Healthy Wales document so much, is because it, it was pre-pandemic, but it still holds water as a strategy. So I think we've got our template for what we need to do. We just need to adjust it through the lens of the pandemic um, and take a much more nuanced focus on um, the, the, the complexity of the impact, but the you know the, the wider framework for responding is there. That's really helpful, I think. Um, I've talked about the psychosocial recovery of systems, so I think that that I'm just echoing my, my own words now. So uh, I think you know what I mean. Um, and we need to be very careful about how we kind of simplify the story um, and what metaphors we draw in and how we compare to other systems to try to understand impact. You know, it, it's always useful to have comparison points, but you know, when you're comparing apples and pears, mm, you you, um, you can fall into a number of traps and we need to be very careful. We don't over rely upon the research or the, the, the I guess, the, um, the learning from other systems like the military um, because it, it will have limitations. So I think I've talked probably a bit too long now. I'm losing my voice um, and we've got time. So that sounds like even though we have problems to begin with, we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, I am going to come out of the slideshow now. Um, if that works, it does. Ooh. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Adrian. Some, some a bit of feedback there. Um, can you maybe pop your mic on mute? That might help. See if that's worked. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, time for a few questions. I mean, I, I found that really interesting. Challenger challenged some, you know, some of the narrative that, as you say, we're hearing around around the tracks quite a bit at the moment. Um, so the first question we've had is um, from I'm not sure who, but it's it's an interesting one. So recognizing that the pandemic's not quite over yet. Um, really, it's about managing change. You know, that's something that we've had to do on a much larger scale over the last year. Um, you know, new IT, workarounds, isolation, remote working and silo working to some extent, the question is saying. How can we get back to basics um, and return our focus to looking after ourselves in, in simple ways in the face of all this change? Ooh, um, I really I like the frame around the challenge being change because I think you're absolutely right. Massive change uh, in a multi-dimensional way. So it's a bit like um, so some colleagues I know um, were unwell very early on during the first wave and when they they made a, a recovery enough to come back into work. Work was so different when they they came back in. It was like a different world. Um, and I think for all of us, the change has been, um, you know, some of it's been very helpful. Some of it is just being um, you know, deeply challenging. Um, in terms of how do we return, and I think that change will continue and I need to adjust and manage that as a demand of our work is going to increase um, because it's a reality, I think. Um, but I do wonder, you know, the, the kind of idea of, well, you know, how do I look after myself in the context of this is is um you know, it's a bit like the elephant in the room isn't it we you know we all have a responsibility to ourselves but um if you're anything like me it's kind of do as i say not as i do um you know like i i this morning i've been back to back and that's just deeply stupid um in meetings but we you know we have to do thing something somewhere so i guess my advice would be use the last year as justification for taking stock of um where you are, where you are in your role, where 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 home is, what's important to you, um, and to reprioritize that. And I think that may lead you to a very simple list of things you need to kind of think about, or it may just be a reminder of stuff you already know, or it may lead you to reprioritize 
significant parts of your life. Um, now I say that because all three um, of those options I've heard from colleagues. Um, I think that's the way to start to um, decide what you need to change and how to manage at an individual level. Although bearing in mind there's only so much you can do as an individual if the context you're working in is is con is toxic or chaotic or you know uh, uh, unbalanced. Um, but it's it's about what you're willing to focus on. And it's a bit like back to motivational interviewing, isn't it? Well, what, you know, why don't we do the things that are sensible? It's because motivationally we may not be ready or feel it's able to do it. So we, you know, you need to identify what perhaps you need to do, and it might be very simple, but that motivational process you need to engage with yourself, I think. Uh, and if you've got a good manager, engage with them, engage with your peers, because they'll all be asking the same thing. Um, I think I've I've kind of gone off piste a bit, but uh, maybe I've I've said giving you a decent answer, I think. That's fine, thanks Adrian. Well, we've got some other questions, so um, that's great, still got time. Um, so the next question is around um, whether, you know, you think the enjoyment of going to work has been influenced by lockdown and the isolation that that's caused, which I think is a really good question. Yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, brilliant question. Um, I, absolutely, for some, including me, um, my my um, experience of work has changed because of the changing routine pattern. Um, you know, uh, I think a lot of people who have been able to come to work or engage in work outside of the home um, have felt that it was a really helpful thing to do because a lot of their family and friends and colleagues couldn't. So I certainly think um, you know the changing working patterns have worked really well for some. Um, now I guess it boils down to how much control you've got over that, which is, you know, we, we, we do like a little bit of control in our lives and that's variable, but um, if you feel like you've got control over your working week and your where you work, I think that you probably come up better for it. I, I worry about those that had no control, so either could not work from home and had no choice and felt not just compelled to, but kind of have no choice over that. I think that group had some real challenges and then equally the group that uh, were unable to come in because they're shielding. Um, I think some of that group um, almost has come out worst of all because they were almost invisible um, because it was very easy not to attend to their needs um, and I know some of the, my colleagues who have really struggled at home um, for perfectly legitimate reasons, but have been in real conflict around that. So, you know, uh, um, personally, I quite like the flexibility. Um, so, my, my week, each week is different, um, but that, you know, that that means I've got choice, and I've tried to do that with my team as much as we can, and that seems to be working. But um, yeah, again, it's another variable we won't really understand until um, we're, we're coming out the other end properly. The real impact of the isolation and the change working habits. Great, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, next question, we're cracking through them here. So as managers, we're asked to help support our team's well-being. Um, we have good resources and offer, but we also know that people often don't use them. How can we create the culture um, and environment where people do take up the offers there, or should we be focusing our efforts differently? Brilliant. Um, I think we could just do a whole webinar on that, I think. And the webinar would last about a month. Um, huge area. Um, I'm really pleased you're asking that question as a manager, because that, that is absolutely the question. I mean, that's the question I asked myself as a manager, and I don't know the answer because I don't think there's a definitive way of doing it. You know, but I guess, if you think, OK, so re external resources are helpful. So, you know, the, you need to know where to signpost people to if they are struggling with various things uh, and also what resources you might need to help you do your job as a manager. Um, but ultimately, you know, if there is good psychological safety in the team, then you're more than halfway there. If people feel they have a voice, which is very similar, really, um, you're halfway there. If you view your role as facilitative, so your role is to enable others to do their work and they believe that you're halfway there because um, you're creating ideal uh, uh, environments for people to um, 
you know, maximize the benefits of work, i.e. it gives them meaning, gives them control, it gives them a sense of purpose, belonging, it allows them to feel connected to their, their world um, and to, to enjoy um, the experience of work. Um, I think really good managers often worry a lot about what they can do, um, which is kind of ironic really, because the, the, the not so good ones don't worry at all. Um, but sometimes it's it's actually a really simple recipe, which is about um, you know not painting yourself as the you know the be all and end all in that system, but understanding your role as as the facilitator of the culture, um, and ultimately you know how you behave will influence that. These feel like interview questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> your next interview question. <laughs> um, so someone said, I like that those who have flourished working from home have have been acknowledged. Are we then anticipating that this group may be affected adversely if they have to go back to working as they used to? Mm, yeah, um, don't know. I mean, I, I guess some people working from home have flourished. Um, you know, some people working well and, and flourish seems a bit dramatic, maybe. So some people have in, have benefited from the, the new boundaries around home working. Um, and I guess if those were to change suddenly and they really, you know, working from home worked for them in that it met more needs and it created more flexibility and control and reduced commute time, then having to come back with no say in the matter probably will be difficult because actually we're, we're, we're tricky because we, um, you know, if we lose something, um, we struggle with it. If we never had it in the first place, we don't really notice it. So losing that will be a problem, I think, for a lot of people. And and I think anybody, any managers reorganising or remobilising their workforce to try to kind of uh, recreate services um, need to be really careful about how they, they um, support people coming back um, because it could be a bumpy ride if they just force people back. Um, and of course, that'll have an impact on morale and productivity and well-being and, and you don't want to be doing that. So as we start to get our services back to whatever normal is, and I don't think that we'll ever get back, I think some level of flexibility will be vital um, because people have tasted something different and may well like it. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Adrian. Thank you so much, Adrian. I don't know if uh, everyone could hear me saying that. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I think we've run out of time, unfortunately, because we had a few more questions there that were really interesting. Um, so thanks so much for your contribution today. Really grateful for that. Um, and thank you to everyone um, for attending today and for all your questions. Um, we've posted a link to the feedback survey in the Q&A chat. So if anyone wants to provide feed feedback or suggest future topics for events, um, and if you'd like to be notified about Public Health Network Cymru's events and activities, um, then please do become a member of the network for free via the website. And I think there's a link on the chat bar for that as well. So it just leaves me um, to thank everybody once again for attending and in particular, Adrian, for your really interesting and thought provoking presentation. I, I found that really interesting and I'll probably be in touch with you. <laughs> so thanks a lot, everyone, and see you at the next event. Bye.